recording. Uh, the Plant Conservation Alliance welcomes today's speaker, Dr. Kay Rehavens. Kay holds a PhD in biology from Indiana University. She is the Chicago Botanic Gardens Senior Director of Ecology and Conservation and Senior Scientist. She is active in research, community science, and plant conservation advocacy with elected officials and collaborates with a variety of academic institutions, agencies, and stewardship organizations to help improve conservation efforts for plants and plant communities. And she also chairs the PCA Non-Federal non -federal Cooperator Committee. Kay will talk to us today about the amazing National Community Science Program called Bud Burst and let us know how we can get involved. She welcomes questions as you think of them. And with that, I will let Kay take it away. I'm going to share the presentation actually um and i'm i'm sharing this online because i was told that can help with connectivity issues so hopefully you can see it uh well enough hold on sorry we'll take a moment to get oriented here OK, I know that's not full screen, but can everybody at least see top to bottom? OK, yes, get all right. Yes. Yeah, thank you. OK. So we're we're doing it this way because I've had a lot of problems with unstable Internet over the last few days. I don't know if it's because school started this week and we have a lot of kids doing virtual studies or um, if it's just my lousy internet, but um, hopefully this will work. Um, so I want to introduce you to Bud Burst, our national community science project. I run this program with my colleague in education, Jennifer Schwartz, and um, we have a team uh, dedicated entirely to Bud Burst, led by Emma Oshrin, um, and she has two colleagues, Taryn Lichtenberger and Sarah Jones. Next. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you really have to scroll. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, so Bud Burst um, runs on the concept um, that if you become involved and you start watching plants, um, thinking about plants, knowing plants, that that will inspire conservation action. Um, that once you know and love plants, you'll want to conserve them. Um, so we uh, run this program nationally and we are working hard to grow a community of plant scientists across the country. Next. Sorry, I had it figured out that I could just click before, but now I've got a slide. OK, um, and we believe that um, anyone should be able to participate using any plant in any place and at any time. Uh, so we have worked very hard to reduce barriers to participation um, to allow um, anyone to participate. Next. Oh, oh too far. Up one. Did I go too far? <laughs> you went Sorry too far. <laughs> So the, the slide that got skipped there just talked about phenology. Oh, there it is. Oh, um, this is the one? Yes. OK. <laughs> um, and what it is. So uh, Bud Burst uh, focuses on phenology, which is the study of uh, life cycle events and their timing. Uh, so when do plants break bud in the spring? When do they begin to leaf out, flower, fruit, and change color in the fall? Next. And phenology is not a new science. Um, it has been around for centuries. Um, the longest record of phenology known is the timing of cherry blossoms in Japan uh, because of the cultural significance of that event. 
Um, we also have data on grape harvest dates um, in Europe from uh, monks that make wine uh, going back several hundred years. And even some of the founding fathers of this country were phenology geeks and love to watch um, the progression of flowers as they bloomed across the season. Thomas Jefferson um, talked about this as acts in a play. So the first act was um, tulips and the second act was lilies and the final act was asters. Um, and we use phenology today to um, understand the best time to plant and harvest crops uh, and many other things. Next. And the reason we care about phenology so much now is plants are really sensitive indicators of climate change. And when faced with climate change, plants can adapt through natural selection over many generations. They can migrate via seed dispersal or pollen movement to more appropriate climates. They can cope through um, plastic responses like changing their phenology and failing those, they'll go extinct either locally or globally. Next. And we're already experiencing climate change. So springs are coming in uh, the temperate region of the world three days earlier now and uh, potentially three weeks earlier by the end of the century. Next. <coughs> and that Plant phenology matters because a lot of different kinds of organisms rely on plants and are attuned to when they flower and when they fruit. So um, there are really important timing matches between when plants bloom and when pollinators are active or when fruits mature and when birds are there to disperse them. Um, it affects our allergy season, something I'm acutely aware of. And there's a potential for crop damage as well. So if we have an early spring and fruit trees bud out um, and then we have a late frost, we can lose entire fruit crops. Next. So now I wanna introduce you to bud burst. Um, you can go ahead, Patricia, to the next one. Um, and how you participate in some of the um, different projects we're doing. So right now there are three different ways to participate. You can do a one-time observation, you can watch a plant through its entire life cycle, or you can participate in some of our special projects. Next. So one-time observations are best when um, you're looking at a plant and you're probably not going to see it again for the rest of the growing season. So if you're out on a hike and you notice a plant, um, you're visiting somewhere that you don't typically go. Um, you can report on the stage that plant is at on a particular day. So here's an observation of common lilac and you will indicate on our website um, what uh, each part of the plant is doing. So is it flowering? Is it fruiting? Are the leaves fully emerged? Are the leaves changing color and so forth? Next. On the other hand, if there's a plant in your yard or your schoolyard or your workplace that you see most every day, um, you can do a life cycle observation and you can let us know the date where it changes from one phenophase to the next. So you can let us know what date the first bud bursts, the first flower opens, when it's in full flower, when you see fruits mature and so forth. Next. One of the barriers to participation is being able to tell us what plant you're looking at. Um, and right now we are um, asking people to uh, use a variety of resources like plant identification apps, um, websites, dichotomous keys. Um, and many of the budverse plants are very common garden species that you probably know already. Um, so we have things like forsythia and lilac and common dandelion and more. Um, but we are in the midst of a website revamp and creation of a mobile app. 
um, and those will integrate INAT technology. Um, so, so that you will take a picture of a plant and INAT will generate a list of potential names for you. Next. We ask people to submit photos with each of their observation if possible, um, because it's really good for um, quality control on our end. We can confirm species IDs and the accuracy of the phenophase identification. Next. So any organization um, in the country can become a Budburst partner, um, and this allows you to direct um, your visitors to Budburst and species that you're particularly interested in. Next slide, please. So if you're a partner, you get a partner page that looks a lot like this, that tells a little bit about your organization and up to 10 plants that you would like your visitors to focus on monitoring. Next. In our database, we have over um, 300 priority species that span the entire US. Um, you can search for them, you can filter out um, by uh, state, by plant group, um, and you can also enter any species that you like. So if if you have a plant in your yard that you want to watch and it's not in our database, you're welcome to do so. Next. So, so far, here are our top 10 plants observed. Um, the maples seem really popular. Um, dogwood, forsythia, tulip tree, and, and more. All woody species, which I find interesting. Next. <coughs> we have observations from around the country, all 50 states, um, 139,000 observations uh, and 15,000 observers. Next. <coughs> Sorry, um, seasonal allergies. Um, <coughs> so you can download data from our website. Um, it's freely available for anyone to use for any purpose. Next. So here's an example. Um, a few years back, I downloaded the data for the Chicago region. I compared it to um, historical records of first flower date um, done in our um, local flora. And you can see, sort of, <coughs> Sorry, it's a little bit small. Um, that uh, for 19 out of the 20 plants that I looked at, oh, that's better. Um, there is a much advanced first flower date. Next. So we are a remote program um, that you can do anywhere, which has been. Um, beneficial for families and students who are stuck at home due to COVID. Um, so we've added a lot of family activities uh, that people can do with their kids, um, many resources um, for both families and next for educators. Next slide. <coughs> um, so here for educators, we had classroom functionality in the past and we have enabled virtual classrooms for all ages um, and ad additional activities that can easily be done from home. Next. We have um, three seasonal campaigns every year, Cherry Blossom Blitz in the spring, Summer Solstice Snapshot um, mid-June and Fall into Phenology in the fall. Next. And we also have um, time bound research projects. And I'll go through each of these um, individually. So next slide. Chicago Ecoflora is uh, a local project um, geared for geared towards Cook County, Illinois. Um, and the question driving that project is which species are thriving and which are declining in the Chicago region. And we drive people to make observations 
via monthly EcoQuest challenges. Um, and you can see our current one that's running right now here. We're asking people to look for New England asters and miscanthus uh, grass. Um, each month we direct people towards an important plant for pollinators as well as a new invader. And so we're trying to um, get locations of uh, novel invasive species in our region and also um, areas that are really important for pollinator conservation. Next. Milkweeds and Monarchs is a brand new project um, just up last month. <coughs> and we're asking the question, do monarch butterflies prefer to lay eggs on flowering or non-flowering milkweed stems? Um, this project will run for five years. <coughs> there is um, some preliminary evidence they prefer non-flowering milkweeds to lay their eggs on. Uh, this may be due to um, the suite of other insects, many of which are predators that are attracted to flowers. And so we're asking people to monitor milkweed in their yard, in their schoolyard, in their neighborhood park, um, to observe for eggs and caterpillars and tell us what stage that milkweed is at. Next. Our longest running research project is Native Ours. Um, this project asks, do cultivated varieties of native plants provide the same resources for pollinators as true native species? Um, and we're working with a suite of species that are appropriate um, in different parts of the country. So we have partners on this project, um, including uh, Denver Botanic Garden and San Diego Botanic Garden. So each of us working with a group of native species and cultivars for our region. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so the driving uh, motivation behind native ours is the fact that um, we have a lot of native bees and other pollinators in this country that are becoming quite rare. Next. Um, so our native bees are facing um, similar threats uh, th that you've probably heard of more commonly for honeybees like habitat loss, disease, and pesticides. Next. And many home gardeners in particular and land managers are trying to do restoration, um, create pollinator gardens, create restored areas that are good for pollinators. And one of the biggest questions we get at the Botanic Garden is, does it matter if we can't find true native species? Are cultivars okay um, in these pollinator uh, gardens? Next. <clears throat> and so you may have run into this scenario. Um, if you're planting a pollinator garden and you go to your local nursery and say you want to plant New England aster to support bumblebees, and the staff says, we have purple dome, Harrington's pink, and vibrant dome. And you say, well, I want to help the bumblebees. Which color do they like? And you don't get an answer. Um, because we don't really know. Um, not much work has been done comparing pollinator use of native species to cultivars. Next. <clears throat> So just a reminder that a, a cultivar or a native R, which is just a cultivar of a native species, can be a lot of different things. Um, it could be a clonal selection from a wild plant that looks different, has a unique trait, and is propagated um, by tissue culture. It can be a highly inbred line um, propagated by seeds or cuttings, or it can be a hybrid between two or more species. Next. And the reason we care is because pollinators may care. Um, some of the traits we select for in these cultivars are things that are really important to pollinators. Things like flower shape, flower color, spur length, scent, um, the amount of pollen present, the amount of nectar present. Next. 
And you can participate in this project even if you can't identify pollinators to species because most of us can't, including myself. Um, we just ask you to identify to guild. So most people are using this seven guild um, set of pollinator groups, identifying hummingbirds, beetles, butterflies and moths, honeybees, bumblebees, small bees and flies, and large bees and wasps. And um, if that's too daunting, if you're working with a group of young kids, we have three categories you can use, and those are hummingbirds, butterflies and moths, and everything else. Or if you're really good at it, um, we do break these down into 14 different categories. So if you're confident in telling a small bee from a fly or a large bee from a wasp, um, or even putting species names on your pollinators, we can accommodate that too. Next. So here's an example of the data sheet for collecting native R data. Uh, you can also enter it directly into our website. Our, um, our website is currently mobile responsive. And as I mentioned, we'll have an app available soon. Next. And so kind of to sum up what Budburst is about, um, we're really trying to engage families, um, school science classes, community organizations, youth groups, as many audiences as possible um, in nature-based learning and community science. And next I'm going to show you a little bit about what we're learning. So next slide. What are we learning? Next slide. <laughs> <clears throat> Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, Budburst can be downloaded. Budburst data can be freely downloaded and it has been used um, for a number of um, research projects that we're aware of. Um, and then we also use it for our own purposes and do our own analyses. Um, so this is an example, um, Sue Kim and his group out of University of Washington used Budburst and other data sets to look at um, how cherry blossom bloom time is likely to change uh, with climate change. So the top panel there um, is historical data and you can see Washington DC is in kind of that orange color which is early April bloom time for cherry blossoms. And then the six panels underneath it are um, the top row are emissions reduction scenario and the bottom row is business as usual scenario and then the columns are different time frames. So if you look at the lower right panel, so that's the end of the century under business as usual. And you can see Washington DC there right on the border of the blue and kind of chartreuse color, which would indicate that cherry blossoms would be blooming prior to March 5th um, by the end of the century in Washington DC, which has implications for um, cherry blossom tourist um, activities um, and also the fact that um, if fruit trees are blooming that early, their chances of being hit by a late frost also increases. Um, next slide, please. Um, and this is work that was done by Wolkovich and Cleland, and they looked at phenological differences between invasive species and common species, common native species, um, asking if the invaders leafed out earlier or stayed green later. Um, and they found that they did uh, using Budburst and other data sets as well, um, which supports the theory that invaders may be so successful or in part so successful because they have a longer season for photosynthesis. And it also opens up the application of targeting invasive management early in the season before the natives leaf out. Next. 
So this is a garden grad student, Emenia Valdez, um, who is working on budverse nativars for her master's thesis. And so the results I'm presenting now are hers and um, an REU intern, Christian Avicedo, who worked with her last summer. Next. So this figure um, on the right, the colored bars, shows a number of pollinator visits to um, wild type in green and three different cultivars of Penstemon digitalis. Um, so you can see the wild type is um, the most visited, um, but not significantly different from the cultivar called Pocahontas, um, but significantly better than the other two cultivars called Blackbeard and Husker Red. Uh, this is due in part to the number of flowers. So the bottom row of the panel on the left shows number of open flowers. Um, so you can see wild type there in the first um, and Pocahontas at the far right, um, which actually at peak flowering had more flowers than the wild type open, but um, still um, the wild type uh, had more pollinator visits. Next. And then Amenia was looking at um, who visited these plants. And again, you can see uh, a lot of similarity between the wild type and Pocahontas and um, the distribution of types of pollinators that visited it. Um, and then Blackbeard and Husker Red had a slightly, slightly higher um, uh, visitation by butterflies and moths, um, large bees and wasps, and things she wasn't sure about. Um, so this is probably due to differences in flower size and shape. Next. And this is some work that she started with a high school student um, named Tawny looking at floral guides in Black Eyed Susan. And so many um, flowers have these flo floral guides or nectar guides that are visible under UV light, but not um, visible to us, uh, but they are visible to bees. And so she's looking at um, Rudbeckia fulgida and its cultivars uh, to look at the length and the shape of the floral guides. And her preliminary data, we don't have a figure for it yet, um, indicates that the wild type has longer floral guides than the cultivars do. Next. Okay, I want to um, wrap up with a few um, little hints of what's to come. So next slide. As I mentioned, um, we're in the process of redoing our website and building a mobile app. So you guys are the first outside the garden to see the look and feel of the new website. Um, you can see some of our mocked up um, web pages and what our mobile app will look like and uh, visualization of what the species recognition technology powered by INAP will look like on the website. So we're really excited about this. We hope to launch in January, so we'll be all set for the growing season next year. Next. And we're also thinking about um, what pr research projects will launch next, um, particularly as um, Native Ours winds up. Um, so we might do something related to urban heat island and do invasive species have an advantage in a warming world. We're thinking about a project looking at um, seed maturation phenology. Uh, to help folks who are out collecting seeds for restoration. And we <coughs> have a data set. It's actually a set of diaries of Cook County Forest Reserve naturalists that ranged from 1940 to 2009. That has a lot of phenological data in that. Um, and so we're going to digitize those and compare them to contemporary data in Cook County Forest Reserves. 
But I want to emphasize that Bud Burst is a community science program and part of that means we would love to hear from the community what questions they would like answered. So if you have ideas um, that you think our 15,000 and growing team of community science uh, volunteers could help you with, um, please let us know and uh, you may see your project up on Bud Burst sometime soon. So I think that was my last slide. Go one more, yeah. Um, please reach out if you have questions. Um, I'm happy to answer them now or you can email me or info at budburst.org for more information. Thank you. And thank you, Kay. That I really enjoyed that. That is so exciting. You packed so much cool stuff in there. I really love the movie Back to the Future, so that was great to see too. Um, I think all of those ideas for research projects are very interesting. I, I'll start off the questions, if I may, with one um, that you may have mentioned, so pardon me if, if you explain this, but um, is historical phenological data in bud burst as well or is that is it the collection data that's in bud burst and then you have to match it to the historical stuff right we do not have archived um, historical data um, so it's uh it starts in 2007 um so we're you know 13 14 years old now um, but we do not have data prior to that but with the Cook County project, for instance, that would ostensibly become part of. Yeah, um, it, if it becomes a research project, we would post the data that we digitize from all those diaries um, into here. Uh, there is the National Phenology Network um, that uh, does archive historical data. So that's a great place to look for um, compare it comparison data sets. We differ from NPN a bit because um, we're really focused on broader engagement, um, youth, uh, working with school groups, um, kind of more of the educational side of phonology as opposed to um, simply data. So could I ask a question um, and maybe you said it and I didn't hear it, but um, you said you were gearing things to families and um, especially helpful during COVID. Are you seeing a, a big increase in the use of bud burst um, with COVID? We are. Um, we've heard from a ton of teachers that have been implementing it through virtual classrooms and that it's been really useful to them. So we do have a big uptick um in classroom use during covid and i'd say our, our regular observations have stayed fairly consistent um, because people are still going outside and hiking and looking at their garden and making observations it is something you can do even in these desperate times great thanks I encourage um, anyone on the on the call to ask questions. I have another one though. <laughs> I'm always font. I keep track of questions as I go. So once again, um, I am curious about uh, the 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 Penstemon research and the Pocahontas sort of the number of visits being. Um, similar. I I missed the slide to know whether or not are they a similar or what's sim what's the most similar about them? So they are most similar to the wild type in terms of number of flowers produced, color of flowers, um, and size and shape of flowers. So they they really differ the least from the wild type. Okay. That was very interesting. Now, when with work like that, um, is there some place 
research that's been done based on bud burst is that housed somewhere on um line or no so um Emenia's work is not finished yet she's a master's student who will finish probably next summer uh and we will i'm sure archive a link to her thesis and any papers that come out from her work um, on the website we do have links to papers we're aware of that have used our data um, but you don't have to notify us to use our data so there may be others out there that we're not aware of um, anybody can download the data and do whatever they want with it There's some, there are some questions on the chat bar. Yeah. Um, so. Minette would like to know which project you would recommend for college students. Hmm. Um, so for Native Ours, we did um, pick some groups that are that bloom during the school year, so we have um, We've had columbines, we're adding um, native geraniums, and we have asters in the fall. Um, so that's something that could be done in a college context. Depending on where you live, monarchs and milkweeds could be done as well, um, particularly in Texas, where you might have monarchs and milkweeds before the end of the school year. Um, we here in Chicago don't. Um, but and, and just phen phenology observations can be adapted for students too. So Emma Ashran, who's uh, our new director of Bud Burst, one of the reasons we liked her so much was she had implemented Bud Burst in a college setting at IU Bloomington um, prior to coming to us. She'd used it in her um, undergraduate classes. So she's got lots of great ideas um, about how to implement it and what type kinds of data analyses you can ask the students to do. Great, thank you. And Ray has a question um, about how are you engaging uh, doing outreach with partners, gardens, schools, etc. So mostly through the professional organizations. Um, so, you know, we've done outreach at APGA um, and CPC meetings for botanic gardens. Um, we do webinars for National Science Teachers Association. Uh, we have a, what's called the Citizen Science Academy, which is a series of classes, online classes that um, educators can take on using Bud Burst and implementing phenology studies in the classroom. Um, probably the group that we haven't reached quite as well are land managing agencies, although we do have a number of national park and wildlife refuge partners. But if there are others on the call who'd like to join us, um, reach out to me. As a follow on to that, Kay, if I may, um, I'm curious, you talked about how organizations can partner with Chicago Botanic Garden, I assume. Um, how does that work? So to be a Budverse partner, you simply um, write a paragraph about your organization. You provide a few photos and provide us a list of the 10 species that you would like visitors to your site to prioritize. And then we'll create a partner page on our website. Um, so that's kind of the basic partner. Um, if there's a particular research question that you'd like to drive a research project for Budverse, that's a little bit different type of partnership, but we're definitely open to that too. Um, so for instance, you know, Native Ours, we're partnering with Denver um, Botanic Garden, San Diego, um, open to other botanic gardens who want to put in a Native Our Garden at their site. So does that mean it would be I mean, it sounds like it would be possible for a college to become a partner, but how about even um, a course? So as I don't know what Minette was thinking of in particular, but what if she teaches the same course or some know someone who teaches the same course every semester? Maybe that course could adopt, become a partner, identify 10 species and do Absolutely. those. Um, there's also 
classroom functionality um, within Budverse, which I didn't go into a lot, but there's a lot of functionality that can be used for an instructor to assign a particular group of species or a particular location that they want their students to um, uh, observe and the students are able to see each other's observations the teacher sees everybody's um, so we can we can facilitate classroom use too Great. I'm I'm leaving a pregnant pause there for anyone who wants to verbalize a question because I certainly I'll, I have another one, um, but I do want to make sure folks have an opportunity. Well, can I ask a second one? Uh, it, it, I'm wondering whether uh, the and I can't remember the woman's name. That's the yeah. master's student that's working on the native ours, but. Is she looking at the difference in phonology? Yeah. And is, she's looking at the difference in phonology, not just pollinators, but the phonology of the native ours versus the natives. Right, so she uh, measures a, a whole lot of traits for, she's doing Penstemon, um, Black Eyed Susan, Rebecca Fulgida, and two asters, New England aster and aromatic aster. And so she looks at um, phonology of each of those, um, floral size, floral color, um, nectar concentration and nectar amount on the penstemons, floral guides on the rudbeckias, um, a number of floral size measurements. So yeah, she's doing a lot. Okay, thanks. I also encourage people to raise their hand if they want to in case they uh, in case I can I talk over you. Um, so another question I have is I thought it was really interesting that you that the most number of observations occur with trees. I, I think I have a lot of ideas about why that would be one of them being that they are just such formidable or you know they're such an important part of, most of our surroundings no matter how urbanized we've become. Um, so we do tend to see them and recognize them more. But um, I guess my question would be, what are your thoughts on why um, people are doing most observations with trees? And are there ways, what do you think could be done to encourage people to see some of the other um, plants more? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't really know why um, other than maybe if they're trees or shrubs in their yard, they know them um, and kind of watch them regularly. We try to do um, wildflower walks at the garden um, with bud burst um, information. We're creating activity backpacks for local parks and forest preserves that have bud burst information, um, largely focusing on uh, both native pollinator plants and invasive species, trying to get information on those. Um, so I, I welcome other people's thoughts on how to drive more participation with the herbaceous species. Well, either people don't know how to use their mute and unmute functions or um, they're enjoying just sitting here with a bunch of plant people, even if we're remote. Well, please don't hesitate to contact me if you didn't get a question answered today. I'm available by email or phone. Thank you, and I'll just um, let folks know that we will post this, uh, the webinar, as well as um, the PDF so that you don't have to watch it being scrolled in a very erratic fashion um, <laughs> to the PCA website. 
And with that, we will um, thank you, Kay. And um, for those who participated um, and asked questions today, and for those who didn't, I hope you will continue to, um, you know, if you think of anything, put it in the chat, or we'll or we'll uh, get in touch with Kay afterwards.